going to talk, talk a little bit about um, predicting distributions of, of rare and unknown species. Um, this is some work that we've been working on for an awfully long time now. Um, I started this work for my postdoc, it was really the, the main purpose of my postdoc back in 2005. And uh, for, for reasons that will hopefully become clear, it's a kind of long term project that's, that's, that's still going on. These are actually, um, as yet, unpublished results. These are the results largely that, that we're still. Um, that we're still working on. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some related applications again in Madagascar, um, some colleagues' work with um, conservation planning. I know a number of us here are particularly interested in, in conservation planning. So, um, of course, they're all related. You know, the first part of the talk is conservation related as well. You know, we're trying to discover new species or unknown species and unknown areas of endemism for, um, uh, for better understanding biodiversity, but also for conservation purposes, but the second is very specifically on, on conservation planning. Okay, so starting with this, this first case study, what, what I'm going to try to do, um, particularly in this first case study, is really break this down and in terms of very practically, the, the, in a very practical sense, the steps that we've been through to undertake this project that are exactly the steps that you've been working on in the last few days in terms of what data, choosing a model, there was the evaluation statistics, and then getting the output. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down in, in that way. Um, now I'm the, I'm the geek, if you like, that sits behind the computer and uh, uses GIS and, and, and modeling and, and, and these kinds of approaches um, uh, in my day-to-day in my -day working uh, life. But I work very closely with the folks who actually go out into the field and do the cool, fun um, field working in places like Madagascar. And this is a photo from, from my colleague Chris Ratsworthy, who's an associate curator of herpetology at, at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and he's really been the person that, that's been leading this project in terms of, 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 of all the field work and, and, and testing the, the, the models. This is just a, a picture from uh, Madagascar of one of the, one of the camps that the, that the field crew uses. So you've seen this before, right? We started with this on Monday morning. This was one of the key figures that we were trying to use to illustrate the types of um, results that we get from ecological niche models. So remember that we were building the model in geographical space, sorry, we were starting in geographical space, we were then building the model in environmental space. Remember this was our, my, my way of depicting what the ecological niche model might look like. And then we were projecting that back into geographic space. So remember that the, um, the crosses here are those are localities that we actually know about. The, um, the, the shaded grey area is what we might term the, like, the actual distribution. That's the true distribution of the species. And then these um, kind of lighter uh, open, the, 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 the thinner black lines with the um, uh, this kind of abiotically suitable area, if you like, that's akin to the fundamental niche of the species. So we're talking about the types of predictions that we can that we can potentially get out. And I, I, I mentioned these types like two and three here. Can anyone recall those kind of, if you like, um, types of predictions? Some of the applications of those that we talked about. Right, we talked about the potential of this area three here could be like invasive species, and this is an area that's not currently occupied but perhaps could become occupied because the environment is suitable. We also talked about this area, this is an area here, this area that I've labeled number two, where we don't have any known occurrence records of the species, but because kind of conceptually I, 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 I've colored it in, in, in gray, this is actually occupied by the species. This is an area that we don't know is occupied, but in fact actually is occupied. So the theory is that if we go there, we would expect to find the species. We would expect to get ourselves some more of these crosses, some more current records. Another bit of theory then is that this area three up here might be actually unoccupied by this particular species, but if we again, and this comes back to some of the discussions yesterday, if we, if we assume that there's some geographic barrier here that might be restricting gene flow, then if there are some populations of, 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 of related organisms up here, then we might expect that that's an area where we would find um, unknown endemism. We might find 
closely related species to our, our, our species of interest, so it's occupying a very similar ecological niche, but because of its unsuitable habitat, again, we assume an allopatric mode of speciation, we might expect that that's a place where we have populations that have diverged and could potentially be unknown species. Okay? So that's the kind of theoretical background, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go out, we're going to build a bunch of these models, we're going to project them geographically, we're going to, in effect, laminate a map and send it out with the field crews and say, well, you know, we can't be sure, but we think that these particular areas here, if you visit areas, kind of types of predictions two and three, these are the kinds of areas where we think we've got a higher chance of finding new populations or unknown populations of this species, and potentially also unknown species, unknown endemism that's, that are closely related to the, um, the, the species that, that we're actually studying. So that's the theory behind what we're trying to do. So what did we do? Well, we started, I, I sat in the herpetology department at the, at the Museum of Natural History in, in, in New York. These are, you know, literally in, in the collection space next to my office, jars and jars and jars of specimens. So we were taking all the records that we had, or we get hold of, not just from the museum in New York, but from all around the world. We were taking these um, uh, specimens, we were looking at the labels, we were getting off the, the X and Y coordinates, or georeferencing geo those localities as best as we could. And then, bottom one of that. So those are our current records. Okay? It's exactly the kind of thing that you've been doing. It's the equivalent of your lion and elephant data that you've been working with this, this week. We then did some GIS work. We generated a database of environmental layers. Exactly the kinds of things that you've been working with. So we worked with um, the temperature data from the World Clip data set. Exactly the data that you've been working with. Just clipped out for, um, for Madagascar. Actually the precipitation data that we've been using for this study um, is, is, is a part of it has been um, uh, precipitation data from it's essentially satellite information. So instead of taking the weather station data from around Madagascar and then interpolating that data, kind of smoothing it over the landscape, we've used remote sensing imagery um, or, or that, that has been processed to, to look at the in effect the density of clouds that tells us something about precipitation. So there's an, a, another data source that we've used and, and the argument that we were, that the theory behind that was that we were able to pick up precipitation patterns better through using remote sensing than through using interpolations from weather stations. And we played around with, with other layers, not all of which went in the model, but things like um, digital elevation models, so um, aspect and slope, some of these other um, variables that, that could be important for, for our species of interest, which, which are all um, amphibians and reptiles. So we had occurrence data, we had environmental data, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and build the ecological niche model to associate the two. Um, so uh, this is back in 2005, 2006. At the time, this newfangled approach called Maxent was just uh, kind of coming on board and we were working with um, Stephen Phillips, who was, who was developing this method at, at the time. Um, in fact, slightly embarrassingly, you'll see that this is such an old slide that it still says that the 2006 paper was in press at the time. <laughs> Remember to change that bit. Okay. Um, but anyway, so we took um, uh, the, the, the Maxent model, but we were very aware at the time that, as we've talked about a lot this week, two different models can give two different predictions. So we took another method, we took the Gart method. Um, again, another method that you've played with this week. It has been extremely widely applied. Um, it's actually been applied in some preliminary, not preliminary, that's not the right way to put it, but some earlier work that Town and, and Enrique had, had worked on, and this was really building on that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so we uh, both kind of other choice because they, they already used this method, so we kind of had the standard at the time and, and the, the, the new approach. We needed more than needed more than one, so that was uh, our, our kind of uh, reason for choosing the two. And you've seen the Maxent interface. If you haven't seen this interface, you've been running Open Modeler, um, to, you've been running GARP in Open Modeler. This is the desktop GARP application, which you'll see is not that dissimilar to the Maxent um, tool. Um, 
but uh, essentially it's, it's just running exactly the same approach that you've run through your open model. It's, it's, um, it's running the same, exactly the same kind of code, but in a different way. Now, this was an example of where we, we really felt that in this study we, we wanted to set some thresholds on the results. Um, we wanted to be able to say to the field crews, well, you should go here, and we don't recommend that you go here, rather than presenting a probability surface. In fact, the field crews kind of saw the probability surfaces as well, but we really wanted to present them based on some criteria of setting a threshold. We wanted to say, well, we think this is within the niche, and we think this is outside the niche. So, how are we going to set a threshold? Well, again, this is the figure that you've seen. Um, uh, on purpose, so that we have this kind of continuity, um, but we were setting some thresholds. So the classic one that we used was this low, lowest presence threshold, or the minimum training presence uh, that, that, that you've heard about. This was, remember, the, the threshold that gives you the smallest area, but that doesn't create any emission. And I've talked about this earlier in the week with this particular case study, with this particular data set, we had high confidence in the georeferencing, we have high confidence in the species IDs, so any occurrence records that fall outside our prediction, we're pretty, we're pretty certain that you know are not good. So we didn't want to be accepting this error term that, that Enrique and Tam have talked about. We didn't want to be accepting some degree of emission. We wanted to make sure that we had no emission from our calibration points. We did another thing in this study, which was to actually, if you like, relax that threshold, so to, to lower the threshold which gave us a slightly broader area, which is of course the exact opposite of this approach that you've been using where you've said, well, let's omit a few points, let's squeeze it in as tightly as we can. We were actually saying, well, we want to find those areas in the landscape that are kind of similar to where we found the species, but they don't have to be exactly the same. So let's just relax that threshold and pick out some slightly broader areas. And we tested these two um, alternative approaches. So we could, um, we could build our models, 